Howdy, howdy all. Welcome to Goose Talks Film. I'm your host, Goose. Thank you for once again joining me where we discuss and review movies weekly. Uh, this week, we've got another new release film, the 2023 movie, The Boys in the Boat, that is currently uh, in cinemas. Uh, it was released roughly, I think, around Christmas time uh, in America and a lot of other uh, larger cities and states. Where I live, we uh, just got it. I think it's in its second week of showing here. Uh, so I have seen this movie. I'm ready to uh, review it. Uh, yeah, so The Boys in the Boat is George Clooney's uh, ninth time as director. Um, a lot of people might not know that he even directs. Uh, George Clooney actually has quite a um, back catalog catalog sorry of movies he's directed. Uh, yeah, so like I said, this is his ninth. He's directed movies like Good Night and Good Luck, Leatherheads, The Odds of March, uh, The Monuments Men, Suburbicon, The Midnight Sky, The Tender Bar, and The Boys in the Boat. Also directing um, a few episodes of TV series as well. Uh, a few of these movies are actually quite uh, well received, especially Good Night and Good Luck and The Odds of March, which were both movies that were uh, in the race uh, at a major awards, awards shows in their respective years. Uh, so the Boys in the Boat tells the story, um, a 1930 set story centered on the University of Washington's rowing team from their Depression era beginnings to winning gold at the 1936 Berlin Olympics. Uh, so this is obviously based on a true story, uh, quite an amazing true story as well. Um, I'll obviously dive a bit more into that when I get into the spoiler territory part of the show. Um, yeah, so this, like I said, tells an, an amazing story. From what I can gather, it's re- relatively uh, true to real life. They don't take heaps of liberties uh, for what I gather, and that also... Uh, Sets the tone for the movie. Like it, I'll, I'll say it now. Like it, crazy things don't happen. There's not a lot of jaw dropping moments or anything like that. It's quite uh, linear uh, in its storytelling. So, uh, from what I can gather from the research I've done, there's not a lot of information on this. I think basically, when you go far as back as the 1930s, there's only really very limited information you can get about stories. Obviously, media and whatnot and record keeping wasn't as big back then like it is now. There's all different avenues you can take with your record keeping and your storytelling and whatnot. So, yeah, like I said, this is relatively true to the story. They obviously take a few um, small missteps here and there, but I'll delve more into that later. Uh, Yeah, so diving a bit more into what this movie is about without getting into spoilers. So... This is based on real life of a junior varsity rowing team. Now, if you, a lot of people don't know how that works in America, it took me a while to wrap my head around it. And please, if there's any Americans listening that want to correct me, please do so, because uh, I'm only doing this with a little information. So, uh, with a lot of team sports in college, there's the varsity team and the junior varsity team. So, the junior varsity team is uh, all new people, part of the team. Uh, so, they've literally just been put together. They obviously still have, I think, four years or however long they're in college for, three to four years of working as a team and doing tournaments and all that. And the proper varsity team in their fourth and final year, they're the ones that usually get relied on to do all the big events. They're, you know, the head honchos, so to speak. But in this story, uh, it's actually the junior varsity team that are actually picked to enter all the competitions and um, go on to compete at the Olympics. Uh, that's all I'll pretty touch, pretty much touch on without getting into uh, spoilers for you. But it, it this tells a really great story, a uh, really really good story. If you love true stories, especially true sporting stories like I do, uh, this is definitely uh, up your alley. Which will lead me into the uh, would I recommend section of the show, where uh, there's three categories I'll put a movie under if I recommend uh, for you to watch it or not. So we've got Go watch it in the cinema, wait until streaming, or don't bother. Uh, so I will be a bit more specific in this episode. I think if you love sports stories and sports movies in general, go see it some movies. If you love real life stories that don't deal with, um, you know, war, tragic losses, you know, suicide, any of the real uh, full on stuff, this is also up your alley. Uh, especially if you like movies set back in like in the 30s, this movie does a really, really good job uh, with really showing off its setting. Uh, you know, in 1930s uh, Depression era Washington and just America in general does a really, really good job. Also, 
does a good job uh, at Nazi Germany as well, uh, which I'll touch on later. So, yeah, I definitely, if you're just a general movie goer and you go to the movies quite a bit and you're looking for a movie to watch, I would recommend this to the general audience as well. There's a lot for you to just enjoy as a general movie watcher. It, it's it's not really niche or anything like that. And I know it focuses on rowing. And, you know, in Australia, we obviously have our Olympic rowing teams and there's certain parts of Australia that obviously are into it more than others. But I would still recommend that if you don't know anything about rowing, this movie does a really good job at kind of holding your hand and guiding you through what rowing's like and how it was back then it, without making you feel stupid. It does a really good job in that sense. So if you're worried that you're not into war- rowing and uh, you might that might stop you from getting into the movie, I don't, I don't think it will for the majority of people. Maybe people that hate sport, I probably wouldn't recommend to watch this at all. Uh, but for the general audience and for definitely if you're a, if you're a sports fanatic or a sports movie fanatic check this out the movies uh it, it, it's probably towards the end of its uh theatrical run so if you're gonna miss out on it you can't find time for it you don't have any spare money or anything like that i would re- recommend to just rent it digital uh i don't always recommend to pay the full-on price when it first comes out just in case you don't like a movie because 30 dollars is a lot to pay for a movie that you might not like and just sit in your library to not watch compared to you're paying, you know, 16 to $18 for a movie to get the movies. It's not as bad because you're getting that theater experience as well. Uh, so I'd recommend, yeah, renting this on digital. Uh, for, and then if you want to wait till stream, I recommend that. But definitely watch this movie if it be in the cinema or at home on your couch. I just recommend it in general. Uh, it's, yeah, currently the acting's great. Uh, it hasn't got a lot of big actors in it, but that kind of works to its favour. Uh, Joel Edgerton does an amazing job. We'll dive into that deeper later. But yeah, for in the um, spoiler-free territory, that's what I'll end with. I do recommend you go watch this. If you miss out on it, don't worry. I'd recommend to get it on digital for sure. Now, heading into the spoiler territory. So here's your warning, get into the spoilers as we dive deeper into... The Boys in the Boat from 2023 from George Clooney. So, yeah, we'll dive deep, deeper, sorry, uh, into this movie. Uh, yeah, just from the get-go, this is a very linear story. It's There's not a lot of twists, there's a lot of turns, no curves, um, nothing like that. But also, what I'll say about it being quite a linear um, story from start to finish, it's not boring and there's not a lot of cliches in this, which is just a breath of fresh air, especially for sporting movies. And I know uh, a lot of them are based on true stories, so they can sometimes be very similar to others because that's just how it is. That's how real stories happen, but that's fine because they're all very different and personal about the people involved telling their story. But when you're watching movies that are completely fictional, that are written, and they still, they're still littered with just cliches and the same old shit, that's when it gets very just annoying and just boring and just... Uh, in this day and age, sporting movies just aren't as big. We don't get a lot of big budget ones. We don't get as many as we used to compared to other genres. Uh, this had a modest budget of $40 million. Uh, I think it's just broken even or just made its money back. So let's hope that it makes a bit more money from uh, digital renting and buying and digital media uh, in general. Unfortunately, we can't rely on uh, physical media anymore. You know, Even as short as ago as five, ten years ago, if a movie didn't do great at the box office, it could still make a lot of money uh, on home video, especially in the 90s and early 2000s. That was some movie company's bread and butter. They'd make a movie for $10 million. They would not spend a lot on marketing, but they would rely on that home media money and it would be enough for profit. So these days, it's a lot harder. They rely on people to be willing to rent it or buy it on digital, which... It's more a lot more expensive. You don't really get deals like you do. Like you could head to like a big W camera or a Target back in the day and get a new release movie for cheap as like you know eight dollars off. But you can't really get that anymore, unfortunately. But yeah, so from what I can gather, this movie has made back its budget. Uh, I think it's on its way to make back its marketing because this movie wasn't marketed through the ass. That's why I guess maybe it didn't do as well at the box office. But I just hope we do just. Get more sporting movies and tell these great stories. It's crazy to me because this 
Um, I would say it's based on a book because they're both based on true story, but a book um, came first uh, about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit earlier. Same title, The Boys in the Boat. Uh, And yeah, that did really well, obviously. And then this movie eventually got greenlit. It took a while, but it's crazy to me that we haven't been told this story in terms of film. You know, this happened in 1936. It's one of the most amazing Olympic stories I've heard, and there's some amazing stories out there. And I would really love to be able to watch more Olympic stories because there's so many out there that you get through documentaries, but watching an actual scripted movie with money behind it with real actors definitely hits different. And I, I really hope that we get more of that because we've gotten tastes of Olympic stories through film with race about Jesse Owens, you know, this one, the boys in the boat. And there's a few others out there, but I just, I want more. <laughs> I just love my sport, love my sporting movies. And watching this movie just really, really like got another passion inside me for sporting movies because this is just a really good watch. Um, so I guess we would, we can dive deeper into the plot line. It's not too long and it's not really even spoiler written to be honest, but the film's plot centers on the University of Washington crew that represented at the United States in the men's eight at the 1936 Summer Olympic Games in Berlin, including the coaches, boat builder George Pocock, and the working class student athletes involved, especially rower Joe Rance, who was in effect abandoned by his family and left to fend for himself at a young age. So, yeah, speaking of Joe Rance, real person, from what I can gather, 99.9% of the stuff told in this movie really did happen to him. Very true to his real life story, which is just crazy. Very, very crazy stuff. He was living pretty much in a broken down car um, in the middle of like nowhere in this like, just empty lot riddled with other homeless people. And that's where he lived while he studied. He couldn't even afford his tuition. Uh, they were going to kick him out of the school because he couldn't afford to pay it. And that's and he couldn't find a job. Obviously, depression era, no one could find a job. And his mate told him, hey, look, we can make money rowing. And they thought, okay, this is a good idea. And they realized that only eight people make the team and both of them made it, which is even crazy. I thought... Not knowing this story before watching that the mate that come up with the idea wasn't going to make the cut and he would maybe be a bit um, angry at Joe or resentful of him, like we'd maybe seen a scripted movie. But no, they both made it, which was, yeah, another breath of fresh air that they both made it. There was no kind of uh, dispute between the two, which you usually see in sporting movies and just movies in general. Um. And yet, tells his story. His pa- he he finds a passion for it. Eventually, he just does it kind of as a job, and a, he gets a bed um, and a room out of it as well. And it also tells the story of Joe Edgerton as um, let's see if I get this name right, Al Ubrickson. Uh He's the rowing coach at the University of Washington, and this is kind of his last ditch effort. He's getting a lot of uh, heat from the rich families that pretty much pay his wage and pay all the bills for the rowing, and they pretty much say if you don't win. You're, you're pretty much gone because they've been very disappointed with the teams they've had. They've underwhelmed and whatnot. And that's really why he makes the decision to pick the junior varsity team, which is unheard of uh, in the regatta, which is the major collegiate rowing race for the year. It's also for the title and for the trophy, but also to qualify uh, for the Olympics. So back then and up, up until relatively recently, I think the 80s, early 90s, was it was amateur only. For the Olympics, so no professionals. So pretty much Americans sent a lot of their college people because they weren't professionals. They weren't getting paid. Uh, so it wasn't like what, what you could see now where maybe in an eight-man rowing team, five or six come from all different schools. They're hand-picked to make this one you know, ultra dream team. Didn't happen back then. Happened in a lot of sports, especially in athletics as well, was the best school was the one that went. So... There would be years where some of the best athletes wouldn't be at the Olympics because they were on a team that just wasn't as good overall, and it's crazy to think. But that's how it was back then, and um, crazy. It's just crazy the hurdles I had to go through too. So the junior varsity team, they were handpicked, they were thrown together, they'd never rowed together before. Some of them never, like Joe, had never rowed before. He was an athletic guy, from what I can gather, for 1930 standards at least, and they all just were just good at it. They coached and pushed well and yeah they were the only junior varsity team to to compete at the regatta and not only did they win I'm pretty sure they broke the record or got close to breaking the record or something like that and 
they got then they got they got screwed over. They completely and utterly got screwed over that they had to fund their own trip to the Olympics, and it was they had to come up with in two weeks they had to come up with five thousand dollars, and that converts to roughly about one hundred ten thousand dollars in today's money. And I know that it's all different. We all make more money now, but that that now with our wage and our income and how inflation and money is now, if you were to come to me and say, "Hey, look, you qualify qualify for the Olympics. You're the best team out there," but You've got to come up with 110 grand in two weeks. That would be almost impossible to do. And there's a great scene between another breath of fresh air that wasn't a cliche was there was another coach. Uh, he was a coach of California. They're the favorite team. They had won, I think, eight years in a row. Um, but I think they ever actually won the Olympics. And I think that was why a big thing America always underperformed in the rowing for such a rowing rich nation. Uh, his name was Kai, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And he was an older gentleman compared to Al. And he wasn't like an evil, you know, the evil villain from the other school or the other team that's an asshole and he just bullies and picks on everyone, like, you know, like the coach from Mighty Ducks. And one of the, the, the biggest cliches in sporting movie is that role of the evil villainous coach from the other team that is abusive and is an asshole and evil and does all this trickery to try and stop the main protagonist from winning. And like, he makes a smart ass comment saying, oh, my boys are sick, like, go easy on them. And then Al says, oh, you know, even if you were telling the truth, I wouldn't I wouldn't believe you, or I wouldn't do it, sorry. Um, and they have a bit of banter. They give each other a nod, like, when, when Kyle loses in the just the junior race, just between the two colleges before the regatta, and it gives him a nod, like, you know, fair enough. And then, yeah, pretty much the same happens in the regatta. He's kind of, as you would be as a coach, Kyle's disappointed, but gives him his flowers. And then towards the end, I think, it's their last night to come up with the five thousand dollars, and they're about three hundred dollars short. Kai comes in and says, "Hey, my boys really, really want to go, but you deserved it. Your boys have to go. Here's a check for three hundred dollars, and you owe me." As it's a very good saying, it's from, again from what I can gather that did happen at least to an extent. He did he did give money. It might not have been at the last minute of the night and the exact amount they needed. But from what I can gather, he did donate money and it really did push them to be able to go over to the Olympics. So that, that was a really great scene. Like I said, breath of fresh air that not everyone in the world, even from opposing coaches and stuff, you don't dislike each other inside or outside of the game or the sport. It's just not how... It, yeah, there are occasions where, yeah, you do hate each other just for just personal reasons maybe. But it was a breath of fresh air that... He was just being human. Uh, it was just a yeah, a really, really great scene. Great acting from both of those, Joel Edgerton and the actor that played Kyle. R- really good stuff. Really heartwarming as well. Um, yeah, the acting, the acting in general was was really, really good. Uh, Callum Turner, aside from Joel Edgerton and a, a few of the older actors that the older generation might uh, recognize, Callum Turner was probably the only recognizable actor of the younger group. Uh, probably most people know him as Theseus from the Fantastic Beast trilogy. That's exactly where I knew him from. Took me a while to to realize where he was from with his bleach blonde hair, but uh, great leading man. He was just really believable in his role. He looks a bit like the real life Joe Rance as well, to be honest, and does a great job at showing us what Joe was like without like a crap ton of dialogue. Like he doesn't really go on any big rants or any big monologues or anything like that. A lot of it's just them showing us stuff like obviously the one of the first things we see him is him waking up in the broken down cars so that shows us oh okay so he's poor he's pretty much homeless and he goes to put his shoe on and he's got a massive hole in his sole of his shoe so he grabs a newspaper and puts that down to cover the hole okay so he's really poor like he can't he can't afford pretty much anything and he's going to college right and he's studying engineering so like a lot of cases in history, a lot of these athletes, scientists, anyone come from these really rough backgrounds and just goes to show that like anyone can come from that and it's not the easiest journey, but it just goes to show just how willing and and sometimes lucky as well and the opportunities they're given. But in terms of Joe, like he just needed a job he needed, he needed money like he had to pretty much go eat at the soup kitchen and sometimes if you recognize one of the other athletes or rowers that were serving 
he didn't want to be embarrassed by it. So he he didn't get to eat a lot of the time. And then them just showing us that stuff, it really not only does he come off likable and all that as well, but there's also scenes where he gets really emotional and shitty, like he's got um, commitment issues to his girlfriend. And I think that kind of goes down to he doesn't want to be abandoned again because he's, he, he was abandoned by his family at 14. By his father and his his stepmom. So he's literally been by himself since he was fourteen, and them just showing his scenes and little dialogue from him that they do a really really good job at really setting the scene, telling us who Joe is, where he comes from, and where he's going to get to, and just the passion he had, just passion just for life in general. But when he won the gold medal at the the nineteen thirty well, spoiler we're in the spoiler zone. When he wins the gold medal at the 1936 Olympics, he he would go on to work for Boeing for 30 years, and actually, he created uh, a thing called the the Safe Zone or something like that. It was a dust-free work environment. But anyway, he worked for Boeing for 30 years, so he was just passionate about life in general, and yeah, just a really great story to tell. Uh, and on that, this movie does a really really good job at highlighting some of the supporting characters slash actors that don't have a lot of screen time, don't have a lot of dialogue, but they just show us these little snippets of things like, oh, so oh, so this person does this and they're kind of like this type of person. So I think there was a character, his name was Don, uh, if I'm not mistaken. He was the, he was the number one seat. I, th- I think they go from one to eight. So the front is one. If, if I'm not mistaken, it could be the other way around actually. But anyway, he sat at the front of the boat, so that that's sort of like an important role. I don't understand rowing heaps. I'm not going to add like I do, but he sat at the front, and the scenes of him, he's very quiet. He's very reserved. He doesn't talk a lot. He's not cocky and confident. They, he all of a sudden just starts playing a piano when they're cleaning up um, the hall after a, a performance, I think. He starts doing the piano, and he... They're like, oh my god! Like, is there anything you can't do? And he just shrugs his shoulders, like, you know, oh, like, you know, it is what it is. And they said, oh, don't stop! Like, keep going, you're amazing. And it's just that scene alone shows us, okay, well, this guy, he's quiet, he's reserved, he's not cocky, he's not confident, but he's very talented. Uh, it, he, yeah, th- that was a really good scene. That just the one, one scene showed us. And then later on, he sees his girl, keeps looking at him, but he, he can't talk to her because he just he can't do it. He's too introverted. And back then, you know, it was more likely the man would go up to the girl. Nowadays, it's probably a bit different. So, unfortunately for him, he had no chance. And they all then cheer for him to get up in front of everyone at this ball um, or formal, whatever you call it back then. And he eventually plays the piano in front of everyone. And they'll cheer for him. And he smiles like, oh, my God, like, you know, I can't believe I did that. But it's good that people, you know, cheering for me. And very good things like we... We see uh, things from Chuck as well. Thomas Elms was actually one I recognised. He was in a Netflix show called The Order. So I was really excited to see him in something, especially like a big movie like this from George Clooney and MGM. It was really good to see him. He kind of comes off as this cocky, arrogant guy that wears these nice flash suits. And you think, okay, he's kind of going to be the cliche dickhead that picks on the main character and blah, blah, blah. But it's really not the case because we get a, a scene, I think they're heading to the regatta and they're playing poker on the train, and uh, he's been a bit cocky and makes a comment about Joe's jacket, so Joe just keeps walking, and then he calls him uh, Hobo Joe. And Joe doesn't like that comment. They fight each other, and Joe walks off, and all the boys are like, Chuck, like that, you know, that's a shit joke. And Chuck's like, it was just a joke. And I'm like, well, yeah, but it was a shit joke. Like, it wasn't funny. Like, your jokes are always shit. Like, what would you do that for? And as he says that, like, when his mates pull him in, Pull, get him to pull his head in. He looks back and thinks, oh, you know, fuck my bad. So he slowly strolls and finds Joe just sitting by himself, stewing a bit, I think, and just uh, not coping well, I think, with the whole situation, I guess, because he probably would never have travelled before either. And, yeah, Chuck just says to him, look, we're actually not different, you and I. I'm poor. Like, my father went bankrupt years ago. I actually stole these clothes and I just put a facade on. And he said, well, we're actually different because you're not a thief. And he walks away. And it was like, oh, that's just brilliant. That's just all he said was three or four lines. We already learned so much about this guy. And just his, his humility, humility, sorry, to admit that he's a thief and that he actually 
respects Joe Moore because Joe's not a thief and Joe's going through his life being the best that he can be even though he's been dealt a shit hand of cards. Great scene. Awesome. That's pretty much the last major thing we see from Chuck. That's all we have to. And we don't see a lot uh, from three or four of the guys of the eight, nine-man team. But we see a bit of the other three or four supporting guys and th- and that's enough. And I think why they showed us a bit about Don was because he actually got really, really sick when they got to Germany. He just caught a wog, um, a stomach wog, I think it was, because he was sewn up. He just he was sleeping. He had a really high temperature. And he ended up rowing in the final when they won the gold medal. And in that front seat, just, yeah, incredible story. Uh, and another hurdle that was thrown in front of them when they qualify for the Olympics, they win the regatta, they, they finally get their money after getting screwed over with that. They get there, bloody Don's sick, and then they win their heat, and I think it was the fastest heat, if not the record. And the rules are, with a lot of sports as well, if you're one of the fa- fastest qualifiers for the final, you get the advantage. Like You get the, the fastest lane if it's in swimming or rowing or whatever it is. You get the advantage because you earned it. But they get screwed over and they get given one of the shittier lanes where to, on the outer side where, one, it's harder to hear because back then they just had someone yelling with a flag that they had to start. So you really had to rely on what they called, I think, the jockey of the boat, the person with the uh, little like cone microphone thing that's pretty much the strategist of the boat. Uh, they don't do much physically, but, you know, they're pretty important role. That's their role to tell the temp, row, 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 quick. They get screwed like that. They also make a comment, oh, we might as well be in the middle of that Atlantic because they're copping all the waves because they're on the outside. And yet they still win and they start late because they don't hear the starting um, flag. So they're about three or four seconds behind, which is a lot in racing, in swimming, rowing, whatever it is in racing in general. That's a lot to make up. They make up and they win. They win the gold medal. It's just a great story. Like I've said a million times, they're just doing an awesome job at telling this real life story, not taking heaps of major liberties, not being cliche, not giving us the evil villainous rival college coach, um, not giving us one or two of the teammates that bully the main character and they get a redemption arc. No, they're they're all just really good young American guys that a lot of them were dealt shit hands and they just wanted to do something with their life. They wanted to make money. They wanted to prove their family wrong, whatever all the different motivations were, they were just literally a ragtag group of guys that had never really rode before and they won a gold medal at the Olympics in Germany when Germany was picked to demolish everyone because of all the garbage and uh, exploitation that Hitler and uh, the Nazis did leading up because that Berlin hosted the 36 Olympics and you know Nazi Germany was at, at their peak before a couple of years later, obviously, World War II started. And I thought it was a really great scene too where uh, it's a photo finish uh, in the final, the gold medal final between three teams. I think it's, it's definitely Germany. It's obviously America. And I think it might be Netherlands. I could be wrong. I can't quite remember. Or maybe Switzerland. One of those countries. It was a photo finish. There's a really good scene where they don't show you uh, the photo finish race really at all. They pan up as the boats go to finish and they pan to the bloke that's a really important job. He takes the picture as the team's boats cross the line and he has to look to see who wins the photo finish. So you're kind of on the edge of your seat. Obviously, it's predictable. Kind of, if you know a little bit about movie storytelling and just sport in general that the Americans are going to win, but it still did a really good job of keeping on on the edge of your seat. And everyone's holding the batted breath like, Joel Edgerton is, Hitler is, he's leaning in like all of his buddy henchmen and stuff are leaning in and they announce America. That's all they say. Everyone's dead quiet. They're all listening and the person that gets given the photo when it's been decided that America has in fact won, he just goes to the microphone and yells, America. And then everyone cheers except for Hitler. He storms out, he leaves. I'm like, that's good because apparently that did happen. If it happened at that specific wrong event, I'm not sure, but there was instances of Hitler uh, attending the events that he thought and that Germany uh, in general thought that they were going to win, he would go there to attend to see them win and then kind of, you know, gloat and bask in the, the glory of Germany winning. 
So him storming out was a great scene because that did actually happen multiple times, especially when Jesse Owens' buddy pieced up most of the Germans. And that was another good scene, thing, sorry about this movie, was I thought we might get a Jesse Owens scene, and we did. Uh, at the opening ceremony, they're in the tunnel, and they're like, oh, hey, you, Jesse Owens. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's me. And like, oh, you know, they say that you're the fastest man on the planet. You're like, you know, you're going you're gonna to show these Germans what for? And he goes, no, nah, no, nah, not the Germans. And they go, what? And he's like, no, nah, no, nah, the people back home. That's all he said. That's his lines. That's all he says. I'm like, that's just, that tells you enough. It doesn't jump too much into it because that's not the story that the movie's telling. They're not telling a Jesse Owens story. They're telling this story about, about the boys in the boat. But that's just really good because those interactions would have happened. If that happened line for line, I don't know. Probably not. But those interactions would have happened. A lot of those boys wouldn't, would have understood race relations back then, especially if they come from places and neighborhoods where that didn't really happen or they were kind of just sheltered by their family or whatever it was. And that was a really good sound. Like they all looked confused when he said, oh, back home. And they kind of think, I think they realized like, oh, shit, like, we've got our own problems, not just Nazi Germany with, you know, the underlining rumors and stuff about how they were treating certain people was, hey, you know, we need to look at our own backyard as well. And that was a really good scene. Um, the bloke that got to play Jesse Owens, uh, really looked like him as well, so that was a good job. And the blood they got playing Hitler looked like him as well. And another great scene I liked was, um, this movie does a really good job at showing the different classes. And there's a scene when everyone's, the only way to know what was happening back then was the radio. They had their play-by-play commentator in the crowd at the Olympics and it would be fed all through America uh, through people's radios. And it cuts to about three or four different scenarios where people are listening there's people listening in like a big pub as a big group like with the uh, um robber's girlfriends and then it goes to like a lower economic area and then like you know working class area and does a really good job at showing that especially back then in depression era america and probably other places in the world that like olympics can mean a lot to people and it might sound silly but i've talked to a lot of people in england that come from lower economic places in england and they have their professional football team and all they have in their life is work, their family, and their football team. And a lot of them will spend 30 40% of their in- yearly income to get a yearly uh, membership to attend all the games because that's their life. They, they live and breathe their area. They're very proud, and it's the same as the Olympics. Like you know, I complain about certain part, uh, things in parts of Australia quite a bit. When it comes to the Olympics, like I'm, a, I'm a proud Australian. Also, I'm half Welsh, so when Wales competes in uh, international events. I'm just as proud Welsh as well. And so that's a really good scene showing because Olympics does mean a lot to people. Sport in general means a lot to people because sometimes that's all they have. And that show that was really good and they were cheering when America wins and it was a really good scene. Like, I really, really did enjoy that. Um, This movie also does a really good job with natural... Well, I say natural, but it seems to be natural lighting where there's scenes where Joe and his girlfriend are in... Uh, in like a boat on the uh, on the water, sorry, and it looks like natural moonlight, so you just see their silhouettes and the hugging on the boat and they're talking and it's pretty silent. You don't really hear anything except for their dialogue between the two and the moon's in the background, it's lighting, it's showing it's a romantic but dramatic scene. This movie also does a really good job with its set production, uh, sorry, its production and set design, I can't even speak, <laughs> And like it also it would come down to green screen and CGI as well, where when you see the probably medium long shot of Joe in his uh, broken down car before he makes the team, in the background it's got uh, Washington. And it kind of looks a bit like London actually, like old school, you know, eighteen hundreds London. Like you see all the the smoke and chimneys in the background. It does a really good job painting a picture of where he lives. That's what Washington was very industrial in that area, specifically where he lived as well. Uh, so, and it it also does a really great draw, job, sorry, of uh, pre World War Two Nazi Germany in Berlin. You won't see a lot, but we see uh, the boys arrive at their hotel. They're driving down the street with like, you can see a few of the Nazi youth in their uniforms and like all the Nazi symbols down the street. That looked really impressive. It looked real. I'd I'd really like to find out how much of that was CGI and uh, how much of that was. Uh, just practical production set design. Uh, yeah, like I said, the, we don't see a lot of Berlin or anything like that, but from what we saw, it looked really, really good. It looked very convincing. Uh, 
yeah, they did a really good job with that. They also, they didn't do it every scene, but with some of the cutting and the editing, they did fade in, fade out, which isn't really a cutting tool anymore. You don't really see it a lot. It was like, you know, really big decades and decades ago. And that was actually quite uh, interesting to see. It, it um, made it feel like an older movie with the fade in and fade outs. Like I said, it wasn't every scene, but there were certain times they used it. I thought, you know, that's really cool. I liked they were bringing it back and they didn't overuse it either. So, yeah, that was really cool. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff, like practical-wise, is really good, like the... Um, set design, the costuming, the hair and makeup, the acting. like A lot of this was just really, really good. And I'm not saying it's groundbreaking or it's going to win any awards or like that, but it makes it to be like a really enjoyable film through and through, especially if you're, like, you're a film nerd like me where you pick up on things and, and whatnot. It, yeah, there's really not a lot to really pick apart in terms of negative. I've really spoken much negative this episode, but I mean, you you, you could... You, know what you're in for when you watch sporting movies specifically especially a real life story set in the 30s you know what you're going to get uh like i said i wasn't sure exactly you know how the acting was going to be how the writing was going to be um any cliches we would get there you know some of my favorite sports movies are filled with cliches but it all depends on the overarching story that they're telling and the acting involved if it's going to pay off or not and i really just really like uh, sporting movies that don't take massive uh, differences from the true story. And this movie does a really good job with that. From, like I said, from what I can gather, from the information I've read, the research I've done, it, it stays relatively true. I think chronologically, if, you know, a few scenes here and there um, might have been out of order. But again, a bit like the Iron Claw, that doesn't really matter. But at the end of the day... Um, Again, a scene I really liked that maybe it did or didn't happen, I'm not sure, but the scene between uh, Joe and his dad, Joe's in a diner with his girlfriend, he kind of looks and notices that, oh, shit, that's my dad, walks out and he said, Dad, I thought, like, you know, how long have you been back here for? Like, I thought you, you know, went to California years ago and he said, oh, I've been back for a couple of years and I saw that you were doing well and didn't need to reach out and it, it's, yeah, a pretty confronting scene. It's like, wow, like, and he says, oh, you know, when are you going to tell me? He's like, oh, yeah, didn't need to and pretty much makes a smart-ass comment about that he can come work for him to chop trees for a dollar a day or he can stay in his boat and row. So it's kind of like, wasn't sure how to take that line. I'm like, oh, okay, was he kind of being serious or was he being kind of like smart-ass? But I think it was more so being like, oh, you know, you're too good for your own team at college, you know, come help me out, blah, blah, blah. That's how I took it. Not sure exactly if everyone will take it that way, but that's definitely how I took it. Um, and yeah, pretty much says his goodbye and leaves him. And then we do see the dad... He donates a little bit of money that he can afford uh, to the cause for them to go to the Olympics. And then he listens to the rowing uh, at both events, I believe, on his radio. And he's quite chuffed when Joe does win the gold medal. So that was a nice touch. Was That was realistic to me as well about the father and son relationship and just how it was back then. Like That ha- happened a lot. A lot of kids were left to fend for themselves at 13, 14 and get jobs and work and feed themselves and be pretty much apparent to the younger siblings that it happened a lot, especially in that era of America. It did happen a lot. And I thought that interaction between Joe and his dad was probably one of my favorite scenes. It was very short, but it really did what it needed to and really put its message across really strongly. And yeah, just that just even cements Joe as a person that he was really a hardworking guy that, like I said, was just very passionate about the things he did. He knew where he wanted to go. He had goalposts. He wanted to meet him. And a very good scene, too, that I've touched on was, um, I don't remember his name, but there was the boat maker. I think it might have been an ex-coach as well that he kind of helps out and gives advice to Al and the other assistant coaches. He builds the boats from scratch and all that, and Joe actually ends up giving him a hand. Not for any money. I think he just en- ends up just helping him because he wants to. And and they're, they're, they first interact. Joe's kind of admiring his work. They talk about the boat a little bit, and he says, well, if you ever want to give me a hand, I'm always looking for a spare pair of hands. And Joe's like, okay. And Joe's, just keep in mind, Joe's just finished a whole day of rowing. And he starts sweeping. And the guy goes, oh, I didn't mean right now. Like, you've been rowing. I'll have a rest. He's like, no, I'm good. And that scene, that little scene shows us again the type of person that Joe was, that he had an incredible work ethic. He was willing to do whatever it was to maybe further along that 
maybe he was hoping that that would get a good word in that he would definitely make the team and go to the Olympics, blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure, but it definitely cemented and, and showed us the type of person that Joe was as it continued and showed Joe's struggle a bit after he did um, bump into his dad. He kind of had troubles with his girlfriend and he couldn't think straight and on the train uh, to the regatta, he was obviously just not in the right um, space of mind and that's why the the joke from Chuck kind of, I think, triggered him really quickly and that's why he got physical. Uh, and, yeah, he, he, and also when he interacts, um, when he's on the boat, uh, I think it, that's the regatta, I believe, or the Olympics. I can't remember. One of the two races was they're training really bad. Like they're really below their normal standard and they all pick on jokes and know that it's him because he's out of rhythm and blah, blah, blah. And he's arguing and saying, nah, it's not my fault. And Al pretty much tells him off and said, like, pull your head in, like, focus. Like, where's your head at? And then under his breath, Joe says, oh, I don't care. And Al hears him and said, okay, if you don't care, then get out. So the uh, substitute that we rarely see, unfortunately, but he steps in and Al starts packing his bag. He's like, I'm not going to waste my time and beg for my spot. He'll either give me, give me a spot or he won't. And then he talks to the boat maker and the, the boat maker needs a, a pair of hands to help varnish the boat. And they have a conversation and kind of puts in perspective for Joe. And then the next morning, Joe meets uh, the coach Al in the lobby and says, look, I want to do it. We've worked so hard as a team. Like, I love those boys. I just want to be in that boat. That was a really good scene. Again, it wasn't overly done. It wasn't a, a, a 15, 20-minute fucking monologue dump or a, a scene that went way too long. It was just a three to five minute scene between the two. Very realistic conversation, especially the dialogue and the writing where I was like, you know, wh- why do you want to do it? Like, tell me why. And then Joe tells him and in a very realistic and simple way he does. And I, yeah, this, this movie does a really good job at not dwelling on things. And you think when I started watching this, I knew it, it goes for about two hours and 10 minutes. And I think, okay, like how much of this story are they actually going to be able to tell? Are they going to be able to show us the team forming, the team winning a couple of races and then going to the Olympics and winning the Olympics and then a bit of the aftermath? Like, are we going to then miss out on any character development? But it just does a really, really good job at all those things. I mean, we, we meet Joe and his friend early on and then it still takes a little bit until they actually get into the rowing and then we meet the other boys and then they train for a bit and then we get some character development and they do a race and then we get a bit more scenes and character development and then we get the Olympics and we get like a little bit of the aftermath, not heaps, but a little bit that's enough. And yeah, I just, it does a really, really good job at pacing. In terms of all the movies I've covered, which is only three now on the podcast with Argyle, Iron Claw and the boys in the boat, this definitely is the best at pacing. Like it's probably not even close to be honest. Yeah, the pacing's just really, really good. Like, just awesome stuff. And pacing's like one of the most important things about a movie. So, yeah, to, to head into uh, our last few uh, programs of the podcast. So, on Goose of All Trades, we like to rate our movies on four categories. And in those four categories, we rate that category out of five. And at the end, we then get the total out of 20. And then that goes towards the end tally of the year, where I'll rate the top 10 best reviewed movies on the podcast and the 10 worst. So it's always interesting to see where these movies end up because we've got about 10, 11 months worth of more movies. So it should be interesting stuff. So uh, the four categories that we touch on are directing, writing, acting, and cinematography. And within those categories, there's kind of little you know, subcategories as well. Like cinematography will also come down to lighting and stuff like that. And Directing will also come down to a bit of the editing process and whatnot. We kind of just lumber them in together. Uh, So, yeah, to touch on the directing of this movie, I've already spoken about George Clooney's uh, directing history and what he's done. And, yeah, he... I don't want to say surprised me or caught me off guard, but uh, his last few movies haven't been as well received as opposed to his earlier ones. This is just a really decent, decently directed movie. It's not, he's not going to win any awards like that. It's not amazing directing that's going to be put down the record books or anything like that. But it is a really, really good direct movie in general. There are great scenes. We are treated to some very good scenes in the rowing scenes of some long shots, medium shots, close-ups, 
Nothing's overused. Uh, we get a good balance, which is really, really good. And that also comes down to cinematography as well. And yeah, like I said, the, the settings and everything like that just look great. Uh, yes, yeah, so to keep the directing short, I've already touched on a little bit. The directing, I will probably give it... Oh, don't we... I'll give the directing a 3.5 out of 10. So it's not mind-boggling good or you know, groundbreaking or anything like that. But to rate this any lower than 3.5, I think, would just be wrong. Just of just how, how good directing it is. Oh, that's just how it is. The writing, uh, the movie was written by Mark L. Smith. Uh, what a name. What a what a person, Mark L. Smith. Uh, so, yeah, he's got an interesting back catalogue. So he's written Vacancy and Vacancy 2, which are horror movies. In 2009, he wrote The Hole, which was kind of like a teen horror, you know, gateway top horror movie. Supernatural, probably a good category to put it in. Uh, he also, in 2015, directed another horror movie called Martyrs. Uh, in 2015, also, he sorry, wrote The Revenant, which was a well-received movie, and a lot of people thought he was snubbed for a writing nomination at the Oscars for Revenant. Then 2018, another horror movie, but a World War II set horror movie, which I absolutely love, is Overlord. And then we have uh, Midnight Sky, which, funnily enough, stars George Clooney. Uh, it's a science fiction movie. He also wrote The Marsh King's Daughter, which came out same year as this, 2023, which is kind of like a action psychological thriller, maybe more so psychological thriller than action. And he's also uh, credited as writing Twisters, the sequel to the 1996 movie Twister. So very interesting uh, back catalogue and library of work for him. His resume looks pretty decent. A lot of movies I enjoy for sure, especially his horror movies. He's a very decent writer. Again, you know, when you're writing a, a story that's based on a, on a true event or a true life, it's hard to really, you know, be super imaginative or anything like that. The important things you kind of have to focus on when you're writing a true life story is, okay, let's capture all the the best moments we can from this true life story Let's kind of write our own kind of twist on it, all these characters, and tell the best story we can without taking too many liberties with the true life. And good writers will do that. And from what I can gather, Mark L. Smith is a really good writer. And the dialogue, like I said, is really good. We're not we're not uh, treated with bloody overfilled dialogue or massive monologue dumps or anything like that. It's very short, sharp lines that mean a lot. And, you, you know, you don't have to say a lot to mean a lot. And does a really good job in this. So, I'd have to give the writing another 3.5, to be honest. Again, anything lower just is hard. And it would really be hard to rate anything higher than a 4 out of 5 for a true life story. Because a lot of it's already there. But then it also brings its own challenges. So, I think 3.5 is a, a really good uh, middle ground for that. The acting, again, now there's a performance. Is it going to win any awards or or gone history books or anything like that, but they do a great job with what they're given and what they have to do. And again, playing real life people is hard because you know, you're kind of limited to what you can do, but it's all on how you do that performance and how you really um, show us who this person really was and someone we don't really know a lot about, Joe, but the actor does a really good job, same as Joe Edgerton as Al. They did a really, really good job at the emotional and dramatic scenes without being too over the top. Uh, these characters feel very real. Like they, they they do feel like real-life people. When you're watching a movie that's based on a real-life story, you want these characters to feel real. And these these characters really do feel real. And it's really good. Breath of fresh air, like I said, that these people are realistic without the cliche characters were always bloody treated within sports movies. So, again... Oh, you know what? I was going to say 3.5. That's what I'd written down here, but I'm giving it a 4 out of 10 because I just think there wasn't one in previous reviews. There's kind of been one performance that's kind of pulled it down a little bit. There's not one performance here that would pull this down at all. So I I think that it would be wrong to rate this any lower than 4. So this gets a 4 out of 10. And the last category is cinematography. Again, you know, the movie, it is what it is. It is a sporting movie. It is set in the 30s. It is about rowing. It's a true life story. 
But the cinematography is, yeah, really, really good. Like I said, the rolling scenes are really good. They kind of get you in the action. You kind of feel what the characters are going through when they're struggling, when they're rowing. Uh, the dramatic scenes are very well, well done. We, we are treated to good cuts of medium shots and close-ups of the characters when they're being dramatic and whatnot and we're treated to some very beautiful long shots as well like on the water or if it's in Berlin or if it's in Washington and and long shots of them in the boats yeah really really good stuff not groundbreaking but hey we get to see what's going on and whenever you get to see what's going on in a sporting movie it can be hard sometimes because it's so fast paced and they try and show too much or whatever it is especially I find it hard with American football movies. It's very they do close ups and it's kind of hard to see what there's too many bodies and heads. It's kinda of hard to see what's going on. They did a really good job of yeah, just cutting with the long shots, medium shots, close ups. They do a really good job and not to the point where they're cutting a million times where it's so fast paced and you kinda of get a headache from it. Really good balance. Again, I'd probably give this a three point five out of ten. It's just a really I think Good above average score, 3.5 out of 5. And I know that's kind of closer to 5 than it is to 0. But let me tell you now, to in some of these categories, writing and directing specifically, it's going to be hard to get more than a 4. I'm just letting you know that now. And acting, for this movie to get 4 out of 10, it, it's a really good score. I might be being too generous here, but I'm, I'm happy with my, my uh, final ratings on that. So to jump into the final rating, that brings us to a 14.5 score out of 20. Really really good score, high score, but it deserves it. And to uh, finish up the uh, review, we'll just jump into some trivia. And I apologize, I forgot to do the trivia for the Iron Claw last week. But there wasn't a lot of trivia anyway once I looked. So didn't miss out on much, but hopefully I'll remember to do it in the future. So yeah, trivia for the boys in the boat. The actor's goal was to get to 46 strokes a minute while working on the film, which they achieved. That's pretty crazy. Uh, Sir Kenneth Branagh was the original director of the movie before George Clooney was hired. That doesn't surprise me that this definitely feels like that's up his alley. Uh, The actors trained every day for five months. The actors rode for four hours a day every day for the first two months and then an hour after filming. Based on the best-selling non-fiction book of the same title, which I touched on, Prior to making the film, the actors had no rowing experience. In a scene during the Olympics, there is a mention of Rand Laurie in the British boat. Rand Laurie was the father of actor Hugh Laurie. Well, that's really interesting, actually. I did not know that Hugh Hugh Laurie's dad was an Olympic rower. That's crazy. I did not know that. That's actually a pretty good trivia. Uh, The Boys in the Boat was first screened at the reopened SIFF Cinema downtown in Seattle on December 7th. The screening was attended by a number of students from Sequim, Washington, where Joe Rance was from. Director George Clooney said it was really important to us that the rowing community actually had a film that captured the thrill of what it is and the speed. The Weinstein Company originally had the rights to a motion picture adaptation of The Boys in the Boat. However, when the company went bankrupt following allegations of sexual misconduct by co-founder and producer Harvey Weinstein, all of its assets, including the rights to this film, were later sold to Lantern Entertainment, which then struck a deal with MGM to co-produce the film. Lantern's position in the film was later transferred to its newly relaunched Spyglass Media Group with MGM's former chairman and CEO, Gary Barber. The film was ultimately distributed by Amazon MGM Studios, the new name of Amazon Studios following Amazon's acquisition of MGM in 2022. Members of various boat clubs in the area, such as St. Hugh's Boat Club, Merton College Boat Club, and Oriel College Boat Club from the University of Oxford, were recruited as rowers for various national teams in the Olympics. Uh, after winning the national championships, the coach is informed that due to other U.S. Olympic funding priorities, U. Washington had five days to raise 5000 to attend the 1930 Olympics in Germany, the equivalent of over 108000 in 2024. Yeah, so my conversion was pretty close. Uh, so last couple, the actors were given a physio and a train to prepare for the physicality of rowing. Uh... One of the power boats following the cruise at the Olympics was named Bosporus. The Bosporus, along with the Dardanelles from the Turkish Straits, the Dardanelles is sighted in the University of Washington fight song. It's harder to push them over the line than past the Dardanelles. So yeah, that's the end of the trivia. And yeah, I'll land the plane and uh, finish the podcast. So 
that's the boys in the boat. Uh, if you're listening to this still and you haven't watched the movie, uh, thank you for still listening. Thank you to anyone that's uh, still listening. This is my third uh, episode, so I appreciate everyone that's uh, still listening and sick of and listening to the episodes weekly. Um, I know that sometimes it's uh, hard to listen to a podcast when it's solely about new release movies. I, I will be doing older movies and, and uh, classic movies are probably easier to access as well, so it's easy for you to watch a movie and then listen to the podcast. I know how hard it is because podcasts like that that I listen to that I'm not always uh, lucky enough to have access to to be able to watch. But yeah, thank you very much if you are listening. Uh, make sure to whatever uh, format you're listening to, if it's on Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, Audible, follow if you love it. I'd appreciate it. Leave a review. Um, yeah, make sure you follow me on all socials, all under Goose Talks Film. Um, next week, next week, sorry, I'll hopefully be covering the Bob Marley One Love movie. So make sure you're following. So you get updated when that drops next week. So thank you very much for listening, guys. This has been Goose for Goose Talks Film, and make sure you're watching those movies.